Okay, hello again, back for round two of the uh, proper lecture, number three on the syllabus here. A um, little bit of overlap here between Loey's chapter that I signed and some of the information from the previous Katz Nielsen chapter. So uh, I have more slides for this batch than the previous, but uh, I'm going to paper over some things rather quickly. Um, talking, uh, the Lowy chapter is, is more of a, a history lesson uh, on the first founding here, uh, recognition of a variety of interests in colonial America. Um, you know, we might think today that, well, the interest was just really of, of the white colonist period, uh, but there were um, more economic sectors uh, involved here, um, you know, between the New England merchants, the Southern plantationists, those who were still loyal to the crown, right, the royalists, shopkeepers, artisans, laborers, small farmers, etc. Um, and the constitution, of course, that we that we have, um, again, the oldest still in force, I mentioned last time around, uh, was really a product of the reconciliation of those diverse interests, right, uh, which might explain why it's limited uh, in its scope today, right. Um, but uh, there a lot of political strife at the time, beginning in the, uh, sorry, 1750s, the British crown began imposing uh, taxes on the colonists. Uh, the Tea Act, as described in the Lowy chapter, um, caused several of the colonial interests to begin to organize against the crown. Uh, the Boston Tea Party, which we all learn about in, in elementary school, helped radicalize uh, the colonists who moved towards uh, a declaration of independence, right, which was philosophically uh, extraordinary at the time. The first document of its kind that uh, advocated for the protection of un unalienable rights uh, of citizens, right? It was politically extraordinary because it identified problems and principles uh, that might uh, forge national unity. It focused on grievances, goals, and principles uh, that might unify various colonial groups against uh, the crown. Uh, this leads to the Revolutionary War, a huge imbalance in military power between Britain and the colonists. Uh, Britain, of course, was a global empire. Uh, at that time, the United States was, was not. Uh, and what you may or may not have learned in, in elementary or high school, uh, a majority of the uh, of those in what would become the United States were not in favor of breaking away from uh, Britain. Right? The colonists were not united uh, in opposition to British rule. Uh, revolutionary armies prevailed in large part because war became just too expensive for Britain to maintain. Right? Britain had its um, tentacles in, in lots of uh, places around the world. Uh, and it just became too expensive for Britain to maintain the colonies in the United States, and thus the Treaty of Paris uh, granted independence to the United States. Uh, the Articles of Confederation, uh, I'm not going to dwell on here uh, because I talked about it last time around, right? But uh, it was really 13 sovereign states with a very weak central government. Talked about this last time, no standing army, uh, very weak executive, no, no president, there was no national federal ability to tax and spend, um, which and states had their own really forms of, of foreign policy with, with other countries, uh, and it required unanimous agreement to amend. So it was, it was pretty tricky. But so the decision was made to, to hold the Constitutional Convention. And again, I went over this, uh, a lot of this last time, so we'll just breeze over it very quickly here. Um, Key issues, of course, were whether or not to revise or scrap the Articles of Confederation, which ultimately they did. Uh, how do we reconcile national power versus state power, which is the Federalist versus the Anti-Federalist? Um, how people and states would be represented? How democratic should the document be? And what to do about enslavement? Um, again, this was all addressed uh, more or less in the last uh, batch of slides when I talked about the Great Compromise or the Connecticut Compromise that... Um, explains why we have the, the um, Congress that we have today, right? A Senate of 100, two per state, that represents states' interests, and the House of Representatives, that's uh, the number of representatives per state based on population, um, and uh, that's the lower house. Uh, the three-fifths compromise I talked about as well, that enslaved people counted as three-fifths for the purposes of um, distributing uh, districts uh, or drawing district lines. Um, the Constitution itself, um, again, talked a bit about uh, who governs according to the Constitution last time. This chapter breaks it down more point by point. Uh, I'll do that very briefly, article by article. Um, 
but the constitution itself, as we know, is a rather short document, right? Seven articles, the first three outline the structure and power of the branches of government, and the others relate to national power and uh, the amendment and ratification process. So the legislative branch, uh, and we, we've got a whole section on Congress coming up, so um, I'm not gonna, we're not gonna get too far into the weeds here, but uh, it, it sets up a bicameral system, uh, division of legislative assembly into two chambers or houses, the Senate and the House of Representatives. It has expressed powers of government that are specifically stated in the constitution as what Congress can do. Uh, and then there's the necessary and proper clause described in the text, uh, often referred to as the elastic clause, which gives Congress the authority to make all laws necessary and proper to uh, carry out the expressed power. So uh, there's a big loophole in the Constitution for Congress to do a lot more than what um, expressly is stated that Congress can do. Uh, Congress, again, consists of two chambers. Uh, the House of Representatives uh, serve two year terms. And the Senate serves, uh, senators serve a six year term. So every four years when you vote for president, you're voting for everybody. Well, every house seat is up, uh, for reelection. And in the Senate, it's only about a third of the Senate each time there's a national election because there are 100 senators and each senator serves a six year term. Um, but the legislative branch, oh, know that information. I'm, a lot of the multiple choice quizzes, quiz questions and test questions, uh, I'll stress what you need to know. I want you to know the terms. Uh, limits and number of years and such for all elected officials. The legislative branch was designed to contribute to governmental power, promote popular consent for the government, and place limits on popular political currents, right? We know Congress uh, definitely moves uh, at a glacial pace, uh, glacially, uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, popular currents. Uh, Congress is not very responsive to what the people want. Um, and it's designed that way, really. Uh, Article 2 spells out the executive branch, which, of course, is the president, right, provides for an independent and more energetic executive than the Articles of Confederation in the form of the president as commander in chief, chief executive and chief, chief, chief dif diplomat. Sorry, I'm almost stuttering. Uh, other powers include the nomination of executive and judicial officials. Uh, talked about that last, last time around, too. The president appoints uh, members to the Supreme Court. And we'll talk about other executive appointments when we talk about the president and the executive branch, uh, indirectly elected through the Electoral College, which we talked about last time, too. Um, Article 3 uh, sets, out, sets out the judicial branch, provides for a Supreme Court, um, and then other federal courts uh, Congress can establish. So really, the Supreme Court's the only court uh, that's spelled out in the Constitution. And again, talked about that last time, justices and judges. Uh, justices to the Supreme Court, judges in other federal courts have lifetime terms. They're nominated by the president, can serve by the Senate. Um, the Constitution does not expressly, explicitly provide for something called judicial review, uh, which I think is pretty good in a democratic system that it exists. This is the power of the courts to declare actions of the legislative and executive branches as invalid or unconstitutional. Uh, the 16th edition of the textbook uh, talks about a, a recent a uh, case of this regarding the 2020 census, the Trump administration wanted to include a question on the census uh, regarding one's citizenship status. And uh, this was taken to court, went all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court decided that uh, the motives that the Trump administration had were suspicious and that uh, and contrived, I think was the term used, and that um, the Supreme Court struck down the inclusion of a citizenship question uh, on the 2020 census. So this is definitely a thing, judicial review, and uh, we'll talk more about it when we get to section, I believe, eight of the class. There's a whole section on the court system. Uh, articles four and six talk about national unity and power. Um, article four provides for reciprocity among states through the full faith and credit clause and the privileges and immunities clause. Uh, these are things that have to do with, say, uh, again, recognition of, of, like, say, a marriage in one state's valid in another, uh, this reciprocity among states, right? Because there's an understanding that states can do things, federal government can do things, but we need states to cooperate, uh, and that cooperation needs to be described in uh, in the Constitution. Uh, however, Article 6 promotes national power through the National Supremacy Clause, right? The Constitution is very clear that the federal government has certain responsibilities that the state cannot, um, you know, state has no role in. So national supremacy 
national power uh, is stated very clearly in the Constitution. Um, within the federal government, of course, we can talk about the separation of powers into three separate branches, uh, again, discussed uh, somewhat last time around and will be a constant throughout the uh, semester, the executive, legislative, judicial branch. Uh, remember, Constitution lists the legislative branch first. I mean, it really, the founders meant Congress to be more powerful than the president, but we'll get to why that's shifted over time uh, in subsequent lectures. Um, but different branches have different sources of power and authority, and this provides, then creates a system of checks and balances um, among the three branches, right? So uh, each branch has some sort of uh, role to oversee the other two, right? And there's a, a good um, uh, figure in the text. Um, I think it's a, the same figure uh, in whatever edition of the textbook you have. Um, but the legislative branch, of course, has uh, its functions to pass laws, uh, to approve treaties and appointments, to regulate interstate commerce, uh, establish the lower courts, the executive uh, executes laws, enforces laws, right? Makes foreign treaties um, and uh, nominates the, the people in the judicial system. The judicial system, uh, the judicial branch has the power to review lower court decisions, decide whether or not what the executive and legislative have done is constitutional, right? And can settle disputes be between states. So uh, each branch has a role to do, uh, a role to play and some form of oversight over the other two branches. Um, so they're all created to interact with each other, uh, with no one being totally subservient to the other two and vice versa. Um, amending the Constitution is pretty complicated, uh, which is probably why it's only been amended uh, 27 times, 10 in the Bill of Rights, and then 17 amendments since. Uh, and two of those canceled out each other, being uh, the 18th Amendment and the 21st Amendment. Uh, thank God for the 21st Amendment. That was uh, the pro 18th was to prohibit alcohol. Uh, sale and consumption in the 21st uh, overturned that a few years later. The remaining 15 amendments can be broken down into three categories, the expansion of the electorate, and that I talked about, Katz Nelson talked about this uh, in his first chapter, right, that uh, the expansion of the electorate has occurred slowly over time. Uh, we've changed the form of elections, say for it used to be um, that uh, senators were uh, selected by state legislators. Now we, we elect them directly. Um, other amendments deal with the expansion and limitation of power. Uh, and then as I note here on pages 44 to 47 of the 16th edition of the Lowy text at least, uh, there's an explanation of uh, all of the amendments, all 27. Uh, if you're planning on going to law school, have a look at those. But uh, you know, I'm not going to ask you an essay question on the exam about that. Um, here is another figure that uh, maps out how to amend the Constitution. Um, routes three and four have never been used. Uh, mm, all changes have been done through route one and two. But uh, I'm not going to ask you to hash this out uh, on an, in an essay on the exam. So while it is important, it's not the most important thing I want you to learn. Uh, so I'm just kind of skip this over. But what I do want you to understand is that amending the Constitution is really, really tricky, which is why, again, it's only happened 27 times um, in you know, a couple hundred plus years, right? So, but it requires uh, at the very least, you know, uh, the House and the Senate to, to pass something with two thirds majority and then three fourths of the states have to then agree. So uh, that that that's a lot to ask for, especially given how polarized US society is today. Um, and again, uh, ratification is the seventh article. Uh, it's kind of a moot point because the, the, the document's been ratified for a couple hundred plus years, uh, but it calls for uh, rat ratifying conventions in each of the 13 states. And uh, once uh, nine of them voted to ratify the Constitution, uh, entered into force uh, as it is today. Federalism here, I touched on this prior, um, be a theme at present. Division of power between uh, or among the the national, federal, central government, whatever you want to call it, and state governments, right? Um, this is established with the hope that competition between the two would limit the power of both. I think it's safe to say that it has. Uh, we talked about this last time too, Federalist versus Anti-Federalist. The Federalists favored uh, ratification in a stronger central government. The Anti-Federalists were opposed uh, to ratification, claiming that um, uh, there should be more protection for states' rights and interests, even though that was ultimately what brought down the Articles of Confederation. It was a question of degree. But at issue, of course, was the nature of representation, the danger posed by the tyranny of the majority, and the scope and location 
of government power. And what I mean by that, um, scope and location is, uh, whether that, you know, power should be more concentrated in state capitals or the federal government, the federal capital. Uh, but, uh, the problem was the, the need to avoid another conservative government. I don't mean conservative like Republicans are conservatives, but a conservative that, uh, conservative in the, in the sense that, um, you know, there's a recognition that the Articles of Confederation were too conservative in establishing the reach of the federal government, right? Um, so there needed to be more reach, but not too much, right? Which uh, I think they did a good job of, of whatever uh, reconciled compromise they were after there. Let's talk about capitalism uh, and democracy. So shifting from Lowy to uh, Katznelson here. What is capitalism? And he describes this as a system based on private ownership of the means of production, on wage labor, uh, and production for the market. That's on page 33. Uh, and, you know, you, Katzenelson is obviously critical of how democracy and capitalism work together and play out in the United States. But, you know, please don't think, again, it's not, this isn't, um, you know, an updated version of the Communist Manifesto here. Uh, do not draw that conclusion. Katzenelson is, is, is clear that there are advantages to a dynamic, productive, innovative, and efficient system that capitalism is, right? We wouldn't be how we wouldn't have iPhones, wouldn't be doing this uh, course online as we're doing it were it not for um, the technological advances fostered by a dynamic, productive, innovative, efficient, technological capitalist system, right? Um, but it is, capitalism does turn out to be another form of who gets what, when, and how. Right. So politics and capitalism, we can see some overlap between the two. Right. Um, you know, it's a, is it, but is it a competing or a complementary form of the question uh, is what I ask here. Right. Um, because there are some flaws, just as like there are flaws in the U.S. political system. We can identify some dilemmas or flaws uh, in the capitalist system. Right. They're very volatile. Markets are volatile. They go up, they go down. Uh, there's a constant need to increase production and consumption in a capitalist system um, with finite resources and fragile ecosystems, right? We can, uh, the biggest threat to the environment is in effect the capitalist system as we know it, right? Uh, it produces a lot of waste that's harmful to the environment. Uh, what these are called are externalities, right? This is a hyperlink here uh, to a clip from a documentary I quite like that's uh, like me getting forever older, a documentary from like 2004 called The Corporation, and it's about corporations. Uh, but uh, the couple of the talking heads describe what externalities are quite well. And uh, these are the, the consequences of an interaction between two private interests that affect a third party, right? So, you know, capitalism's good at this. You've got a, a paper company that needs to make paper to sell to a company that makes something else, uh, but making that paper produces waste. And what do you do with that waste? Well, that's that's an externality, especially if you say dump that waste in a river, which is what's described in the, in the link here. So, um, you know, there's a need to reconcile the conflict between public interests uh, and public interest in needs versus profit. Right? We need the paper company to make paper and turn a profit, but what's the public interest in that process? Right? Uh, and externalities become a reality here, and governments should. Um, arguably do what they can to limit uh, such uh, externalities, right? So um, justifies inherently undemocratic forms of production. That's that's arguably what capitalism does, right? Um, marketplace is not a consumer democracy, but it exists within a democratic polity, right? So uh, again, this is the, the tension between capitalism and democracy. Uh, and then, again, it's a theme of the katz text, so get used to it. Some some students love it, some students hate it, but that's why I, I uh, assign the two books, and that's why, uh, you know, you don't have to do all of the reading quizzes for a book you don't like, right? That's why I build that into the, to the syllabus there. Um, but anyway, there are uh, structural advantages for businesses in the system that we have. Uh, and again, touched on this last time around too. Uh, but business decisions are made privately with public and political implications, right? So here's, here's Cap, uh, Katzelson's criticism. Uh, because public functions in the market system rest in the hands of businessmen, it follows that jobs, prices, production growth, the standard of living, and the economic security of everyone rests in their hands, right? Uh, again, in a democratic political system, right? So what's the government's role here? Uh, we can quote a president here uh, to help create the conditions fertile for robust hiring in the private sector, right? That sounds more like what a Republican might say today, huh? Uh, who said that? Barack Obama in January of 2010. 
Um, so, you know, the Democrats very much understand, despite how they might be portrayed by re some Republicans uh, in 2020 and beyond, um, but uh, Democrats do also understand uh, the relationship between uh, government and uh, capitalism, right, or democracy and capitalism. Uh, and it tends to work out to the advantages of businesses. Why? Because society depends on uh, what only capitalists can deliver, and capitalists will only deliver if they can make a profit, uh, they enjoy a unique advantage in the political arena, right? Um, and they do a pretty good job of delivering, right, when they can make a profit. Again, our iPhones and our, and our, our laptops and whatever. Um, these are things that we all depend upon and wouldn't have uh, otherwise were it not for capitalists. But capitalists don't make, they don't pave roads, uh, and they don't put up street signs and they don't put up stoplights and they don't put up lighthouses, right? They don't, they have no economic interest. Uh, they can make no profit on public goods, right? Which were discussed last time around. Um, so how do companies benefit from the political arena? Uh, they're sometimes given land, uh, patent protection, tariffs, which are taxes on imports, tax breaks, subsidies, um, vocational training, loan guarantees, the military protection, right? I mean, the military exists to protect us all, and that includes all private economic interests in the country too. Uh, public education, roads, airports, these are all things that uh, companies benefit from, right? Um, and these, uh, at all, these benefits attract private investment uh, at all levels of government, federal, state, and local, right? Um, so why do politicians sustain the structural power of business, right? Well, businesses do pay taxes, uh, businesses uh, do have something to do with constituents' well-being, right? When constituents are happy because business is good, uh, that tends to have electoral consequences, right? Uh, when ec economic times are good, people tend to get reelected. So politicians have an interest in businesses doing well and constituents doing well. Businesses also donate to campaigns. Uh, and this arguably is a problem. It will come up again uh, later in the semester or throughout the semester. Um, but let me ask, can business interest be thwarted? Katz Nelson says, kind of. Uh, businesses uh, do not always align politically, right? Uh, not all businesses uh, think alike, not all, not all act in unison. Um, we can identify commonalities, but, you know, different businesses respond different politically. Uh, policymakers respond to many pressures, not just to big business. Um, and if enough of his voters do pressure policymakers, which is to say elected officials, they will listen to us more than they listen to business because again, businesses don't vote. Um, pu public opinion still matters, right? Um, but uh, in this country, for a lot of different reasons, um, you know, income inequality is an increasing reality uh, and that facilitates, uh, exacerbates the interest of, of wealthy individuals, but it also tends to uh, uh, exacerbate the uh, influence and interests of uh, companies too, right? And so here you see from Katz Nelson, uh, the Gini coefficient is just a mathematical way to describe uh, income inequality. Uh, the closer to zero your country is, the more equal it is, and the higher that number is, the more unequal it is. And among most Western democracies, the United States is the most unequal, and that inequality has grown uh, over the decades, in recent decades, right? Um, so while Katz Nelson was saying, hey, you know, Businesses don't control everything. Um, inequality and moneyed interests, which includes individuals and businesses, because those wealthy individuals tend to work in the businesses, um, it's, it's, it's growing, right? So here you have uh, the 1% share of total national income uh, from the mid-1970s to about 2000. Uh, and again, USA, USA uh, has the wealthiest top 1%, which by uh, the late 20th century, the top 1% uh, controlled about 16, 15% of over 15% of, uh, national income, right? So, you know, we can talk about uh, the influence of business. We can say that it's not the most influential institution in the country, but, um, you know, it is definitely, uh, powerful. Uh, let's shift gears and talk, uh, about the Van Vechten text for the first, first time, the California politics book. Um, and again, early in the semester, I always do this, the, 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 I separate the texts out, but as they can, as they more overlap, uh, as we get into the semester, uh, I'll start tying them in together in the lecture here. Um, but California is a really interesting place. 
um, you know, one of the world's 10 largest economies. If you compare California's economy to that of other uh, independent sovereign states, right? it's the sixth largest economy in the world in 2016, 2.6 trillion gross domestic product. Uh, it rivals the size, the economy of France, Brazil, Russia, Italy, and India. And so California is a pretty interesting, interesting place. Here you see in 2016, the, the what I just described, um, you know, California is responsible for a big chunk of the U.S. economy, obviously, right? Way more than any other state that we could identify. Um, and standing alone, California really punches uh, in the heavyweight uh, division, right? Uh, it's also one of the world's most diverse societies with nearly 40 million people. One in eight people in the United States live in California. One in four in California are immigrants. Uh, just over that largest city, as we know, is Los Angeles. Median income is above that of uh, the average income in the United States. However, persons living in poverty is uh, uh, as a percent higher than the uh, national average. Uh, I do think uh, as California is the most popular state, California has uh, also way more um, homeless people, uh, houseless individuals uh, than unhoused individuals than any other state uh, in, the, in the union. Right. I think about one quarter, if I'm not mistaken, about one quarter of homeless people in the United States live in California. Um, ethnic makeup of California. This is from the textbook, the Van Becton textbook. Um, you'd be surprised. There's a higher percentage of African-Americans in my home state of Kansas than in California. Um, it's well over 5.7 percent in Kansas. Um, but uh, California is way more diverse in terms of its uh, Hispanic Latino population and Asian uh, population than uh, a lot of other states, uh, logically, on both counts. So it is a hyper-diverse uh, society, as uh, Van Vechten describes it. It's also distinctive politically, and this is just an overview. We're going to come back to, uh, back to what makes California unique throughout the semester. But um, what is most unique about it um, is that it's what we call a hybrid democracy, combining represented democracy with direct democracy. Representative democracy, we talked about last time, where citizens elect representatives, um, but in a direct democracy, citizens can vote directly on laws, uh, and you call these initiatives or propositions, I think, formally in California. But uh, that's unique. Not every state does this. Not every state can hold a direct vote like that on policy measures. Uh, so political reform is common in California. Um, this allows the people within the political system, voters, to, to tinker with different parts of government uh, through the initiative initiative process, and that's led to tax reform, uh, term limits, the legalization of cannabis, uh, new types of primary elections, you know, things that, that really affect you in your day-to-day -day life if you care to stop and think about them. Um, and that's a kind of a joke and, and very true. I mean, it's more than just legalization of, of uh, cannabis, right? These things like tax reform and term limits and primary elections uh, are changes that are unique in California, and uh, you can uniquely engage in them uh, as voters. Uh, I like this uh, little cartoon from the Van Vechten text, uh, the four seasons in California, the earthquake season, the bushfire season, the mudslide season, and denial. Uh, of course, an earthquake can happen at, happen at any time, which is uh, why that's the fatal flaw of this cartoon. It's not as uh, smart as I think the uh, author might have thought it to be, um, but it is still funny. Um, I'm going to go quickly through just a, some slides on California history. Um, but uh, we talk about this independent spirit that was fostered by relative isolation of California. And I think that independent spirit manifests itself today in the direct democracy that California has. Um, I mean, I see a connection between the independent spirit and the, the, the mechanism of, of direct democracy. Uh, vast natural resources fed optimism about the future and promise for a better life. That's why population in California has has continuously grown since uh, the state was founded. Um, obviously, this didn't happen without displacement of uh, thousands, hundreds of thousands, not millions of African or Native Americans in California, a marginalization and discrimination against Asian uh, immigrants and Asian Americans, um, and uh, an ongoing Spanish and then Mexican influence once Mexico became independent from Spain um, before the United States took uh, about a third of northern Mexico uh, from uh, the independent Mexican state. But um, we see the Spanish influence in California uh, to this day. Uh, we know the Spaniards were the first Europeans to arrive. 
Um, Spaniards colonized what would become Mexico and Baja California first. Uh, it's the long peninsula south of California. You know this. Uh, first mission was established in uh, San Diego, Alta California, um, with altas, uh, you know, high, baja, low. Um, native populations were decimated by the Spanish too. It's not, you know, not just uh, Anglo-Saxon uh, Europeans, but Spaniards who are also white Europeans did a fairly good job of, of decim decimating native populations before uh, California became part of the United States. Um, and then Mexico, upon gaining independence from uh, Spain in 1821, uh, what would become California was part of Mexico until 1848 in the aftermath of the, the Mexican-American War, um, which I mentioned here ended in 1848. Basically what happened is James K. Polk uh, wanted to uh, steal a bunch of land from an independent and weakened Mexico uh, and lined up troops along the border, which instigated a, an attack from Mexican forces, which then justified, and I'm using air quotes here, uh, the U.S. invasion of uh, Mexican territory in 1846, and that war lasted two years. Um, but more specific to California, the discovery of gold shortly thereafter led to the gold rush, uh, and lots of migration from uh, other parts of the United States and beyond. Uh, statehood granted to California by 1850, even though the country was still, or sorry, the state of California was still pretty isolated from the rest of the United States by uh, the Rocky Mountains. Uh, so to get around this uh, isolation, of course, uh, the railroad system uh, network began, the, the Transcontinental Railroad, finished in 1869, was meant to connect California to the rest of the country, facilitated California's growing population, uh, and of course required uh, the government handing over vast tracts of land. Um, the Southern Pacific Railroad, SP, owned or controlled virtually all major industries in California and thus California's uh, politicians in the early decades of the state. Um, railroads weren't built out of nowhere. Uh, minority groups were used for labor and they were marginalized and subsequently denied power. Um, you know, a lot of Chinese laborers were brought into the United States, denied citizenship and property rights uh, in exchange for the, the privilege of building uh, railroad lines. Uh, this link here is very long. This is about a four hour uh, PBS documentary on the history of the Chinese Exclusion Act. The United States passed a law uh, in the 1800s that prevented uh, Chinese immigrants from ever becoming citizens uh, and really by extension present, prevented uh, Asians from entering the country uh, unless they were coming to work for uh, the rail lines. And that that pro prohibition of Asian entrance into the United States as migrants did not end until the 1960s, 1960s. Um, so yeah, when we talk about structural racism, uh, you can see, you can see it manifested in a lot of ways. Uh, but anyway, if you, if you're at all interested in this history, I do recommend, uh, watching this documentary. It's long, it's a bit slow, but it's very good, rich in history. Even mentions Eureka, uh, as, uh, there was one point, I forget the year where, um, white people in Eureka ran all of the Chinese out of town. Um, so yeah, go Humboldt. Um, exclusionary note laws expanded to include all of Asian origin. And again, that wasn't overturned until the 1960s. Uh, land and property owned by Mexican settlers was appropriated by American pioneers as well. So, um, you know, between uh, booting out uh, or removing or uh, relocating uh, Native Americans, uh, limiting the rights and interests of Asians uh, and um, you know, expropriating land from uh, settlers from Mexico uh, is all in the history of California. Um, moving forward quickly, pre-World War II events, Great Depression uh, led to a wave of migration from particularly the middle of the country. The, the, the Depression coincided with the Dust Bowl, uh, which I should know more about given that I was born in Kansas, but uh, you know, there was a period in the 30s where uh, there was drought, land was desolate, and uh, the Dust Bowl um, triggered a lot of migration from the Midwest to California. Um, the journalist and author Sinclair Lewis uh, successfully uh, was nominated for governor, did not win, but he was uh, uh, an early uh, socialist in the United States before it became uh, a truly bad word. Um, after World War II, 
uh, California continued to grow, rapid population and economic expansion. There was a huge investment in infrastructure and growth of industry, right? Uh, agribusiness boomed, uh, reliance on foreign workers. Um, you know, again, I was born in Kansas and I've had students at Humboldt uh, sort of poke fun at me for being from such an agricultural state, even though I'm from Kansas City, which is you know, not about agribusiness, but not agriculture. Uh, and California is like this too. I mean, California is, is the, the country's largest producer of uh, of food uh, because of the, the vast tracts of farmland, right? Um, but um, today, of course, the California economy is very diverse, um, everything from agribusiness to Silicon Valley. But uh, here's a timeline from the text. Uh, let's see, I don't have the Van Vechten book in front of me. I, I do, but I don't have it open. Uh, I don't know what, I think this is on page 14, if memory serves. Yes, it is. Um, but you can just see how the population just has grown exponentially since the state was founded in 1850, right? Um, most recent census of 2020 uh, indicated that California still grew, but it actually lost uh, a seat in the House of Representatives because it didn't grow enough to, to maintain, like its growth rate is below that of several other states in the United States, um, as I think the, the draw of California is wearing off. Um, the post-war politics, we saw the, the equalization of, of political districts. Um, from 1920 to 1965, the electoral system in California mirrored the federal system and favored rural and inland areas. The Senate is now based on population, not on counties. And this uh, represented a shift from rural to urban districts and from the north to the south, right? We know that, that people uh, and businesses, too, are concentrated uh, in San Francisco on down. Uh, and as we know well, uh, being Humboldters, uh, that, uh, yeah, the North is pretty, is pretty sparsely populated, right? Um, recent impacts of direct democracy, and I promise I'm about done here. Um, we can see term limits imposed on state elected officials in 1990. There's a lot of talk of, of uh, a desire for term limits in Congress uh, at the federal level. Um, but uh, people can serve 12 years total in the Assembly and or the Senate. Um, but that's it. Um, you know, there, there was a recall of Governor Gray Davis in 2003, which led to the replacement by the, the, the governor, Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, and talk of uh, recalling, uh, um, what's his face, Gavin Newsom uh, in 2021, right? Um, top two primary system was used in 2012, and that was a consequence of direct democracy. So instead of voting in a primary for either a Republican out of a, a group of Republicans or a Democrat out of a group of Democrats, you vote for uh, somebody uh, out of a list of both Republicans and Democrats in the primary and the top two vote getters go to a runoff. So that could be two Democrats, could be two Republicans. Uh, but that is a unique system to try to break um, uh, the gridlock that is a consequence of the bi-party system, the two-party system that we have, right? Um, another nice thing about California, I'm, I'm fond of it. Uh, you've got a citizen redistricting commission, which is meant to be apolitical, that draws the lines for the uh, districts in the House of Representatives. Because in other states, it's done um, by partisan state legislatures that can, and you can draw lines. We'll talk about gerrymandering is what this is called. Uh, to draw district lines that favor certain interests and certain parties over others. Uh, and that's nominally not done in California because the districts are drawn uh, by a um, apolitical organization. Um, Democrats in charge, in this contemporary history of California, this is the, the short chapter, chapter two uh, of Van Vechten. Um, but uh, you had uh, Jerry Brown's probably the most... Uh, historically consequential governor of California because he had been governor from 75 to 83 before uh, there were term limits, which is why he was allowed to run again in 2010 and served two terms to 2018. Uh, Newsom took over to in 2019. We'll see how long he sticks around. Uh, the Democratic Party dominates statewide elected office. Um, and that's probably a consequence of the two party or the two primary, top two primary elections. Um, but uh if that's what people want, that's what people want. But uh, the Democratic Party's had a supermajority in the legislature um, uh, and occupies almost all executive branch offices. Um, and contrary to what, say, um, our conservative friends might think about Democrats and spending uh, and whatnot, the, the budget has, has had surpluses since 2013, although most states by state law are required to not run deficits, which the federal government does 
very, very well and has for decades, but we'll talk about that later. I think I'm about done here. I think this is my last slide. Um, so continuing growth and diversification of the population. Again, the, 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 the last census in 2020 indicated that the growth uh, is slowing, but we still see waves of immigrants from, from all over the world, uh, Mexico, Vietnam, China, South Central American countries in recent past. Uh, the state is hyper diverse. I mentioned that a minute ago. Uh, plurality of population is, is of Hispanic origin by 2014. Uh, over half of all school children are Latinx. Um, Asian population continues to grow. Uh, Asians in the decade after the economic crisis of 2008-9, uh, Asians actually have been uh, the largest group uh, to migrate to the United States over Latin Americans, which you might find surprising. But uh, the state may be an absolute majority, which is over 50 percent uh, Latinx by 2050. So, um, yeah, big change from the uh, Chinese Exclusion Act in the 1800s. But uh, all for the better, we... Uh, we think. So anyway, that's it for this batch. I uh, appreciate your attention. Uh, see you next time.